Lord, we do thank you for the joy of just being together and seeing faces and shaking hands and just laughing together and singing together and sharing the memories from times gone by. We thank you for new friends that are in our midst and we pray that they'll feel welcome. We pray that they'll find the joy of fellowship and just studying your word. What greater privilege is there? Lord, we do pray for our nation tonight. And as we've been mindful of 9-11 and all the trauma of that event and the wounds that are still fresh, we pray that somehow you would work out your purposes in our land, in our leaders, and have your way in the world. Give grace, grace, and grace upon grace. Lord, we pray for protection along the coast. We pray for wisdom for those who are orchestrating the events on how to respond. Uh, we pray that your will would be done in and through events such as this, and our nation would be drawn somehow through these events even to you. Lord, thank you tonight for the chance to continue John's Gospel. And as we go into the upper room and begin to sense the shadow of the cross as it looms across the conversations and the events and the things that are said there, we pray you would draw us to yourself. And most of all, that you would be our teacher, that you would give us ears to hear your voice and hearts that are receptive to what you long to do in us and ultimately through us. In Jesus' name we pray together and for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. Okay, if you're new, every Tuesday night you'll get two or three sheets of paper. Uh, I put mine in a loose leaf notebook when it's over. We, uh, upstairs we're producing this into potentially a book or Bible study resources that will be available for others. That's why it's taped. That's why the lights are bright and uh, people do follow this in other places. Um, but we got last year through John chapter 12 and that's a real natural break in John's gospel and um, so I said let's we can't stop so let's keep going I'm anxious to do Genesis is what I'm chomping at the bit to do and maybe Leviticus I told you but uh, we got to get through John and I'm uh, this this will work but we're in John 13 I'm not going to review tonight I don't think we need to we're just going to dive in but what we've seen in John's Gospel is uh, Jesus giving signs of who he is, miracles particularly, and calling people to believe in him. And we've seen seven signs, I think, so far. The water to wine, the nobleman's son raised, feeding 5,000, walking on water, healing the blind man, Raising of Lazarus and a missing, a missing one, but signs. And tonight is not a miracle, but I'm going to suggest that when Jesus washed feet, it was a sign, a, a big one. And the definition of a sign, we talked about this early on, is a sign. For me, the best definition that works is it's like the sign out on the road that says Francis Asbury Society. That's a sign. It points beyond itself. If you were all out, if I'd have pulled in tonight and you were all sitting around that sign and I said, what are you, what are you guys doing? And you said, well, we came to the Francis Asbury Society. I would have said, you've confused the sign with the reality. That's a pretty th heavy theological statement right there. A lot of people in the church confuse the signs with the reality when it comes to sacraments, for example. Uh, so don't just look at the sign, look through the sign. So washing of feet points to something. All right? Um, I'm going to try to get you to talk to me some, some tonight. I've got several questions built in here. Who's the best example you know of a servant? Don't, I don't want a name. I mean a personal name. Uh, for me, I just was thinking of this driving. I think it's a mother. 
and uh, maybe my mother. <laughs> um, and then I've watched my wife, mother. I've watched particularly our middle daughter, who has six children, <laughs> mother. And I think about what's involved in serving your family. Uh, that's maybe the best way I know to introduce, I think, what is happening here. And mothers are often not given a lot of credit. We try to on Mother's Day, but everybody knows we're trying to. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, but the things mothers do, wiping noses, changing diapers, going to the grocery store, time after time after time after time, fixing meals that nobody appreciates, um, that's serving serving and it makes a difference. It's the glue that holds all of life together. Um, let, me, um, let me introduce it and then we'll, we'll read the scripture in just a moment. Most of John 13 to 17, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, takes place in the context of a meal. How much of life takes place at the table? But I guess I'm getting some real smiles here. It's like, and Jesus understood this, I think, better than anybody. And you've got about five chapters here, just, just some adults sitting at a table. And they've had a good meal. This, they didn't have a wafer and a little cup of juice. They had lamb and mashed potatoes and <laughs> I don't know what they had. They had lamb. I'm pretty sure about that. But it was a nice meal. And then they just sort of push back from the table and say, let's, let's talk. And I love the word table talk. Uh, Martin Luther loved the word table talk. He, that was one of his sort of themes. Let's just don't go to the classroom. Let's don't go to church. Let's just go to the table and talk. That's, that's powerful right there. Um, Jesus and, and the disciples are sharing dinner. There's something about food that makes conversation significant. I've, already, I've told you that my best stuff is in the footnotes. This is the biblical justification for church potluck dinners. <laughs> and, I, and I'm only part way kidding on that. I mean, it's because I've been to a lot of church potluck dinners and a, lot, a number of them are a waste of time. But when fellowship is right, and the food is good, it may be as important what's going on at the table as what goes on in the sanctuary. It really may. Um, yeah, I'm getting some pastors nodding at me. Um, the best education often takes place not in a formal lecture setting, but around a table with your friends. So that's what we're going to do for the next few weeks. We're just going to gather around the table and uh, listen to and spend some time with Jesus as well as Pete and Jimmy and James and Judas. Judas is there. I think next week we're going to just talk about Judas. He's at the table. And Jesus wants you to know he's at the table. Um, don't think of this dinner <laughs> in terms of our Western culture. With all due respect to Leonardo, he got it wrong. Do you remember his picture of the Last Supper? He uh, pictures high chairs with a high table and 13 men sitting on the same side of the table. <laughs> you know, it's like, and so they're sort of standing, out, but it's like, that's, it's, a, it's a famous picture. I've never quite known why it was so famous. But uh, with all due respect to Leonardo, that's not, try to erase that from me just putting it in your mind. How's that? Uh, think rather of a low table maybe eight or ten inches tall, perhaps shaped like a U. There's some debate on what shape it would be in, but probably with the U, where there was sort of a head of the table. Uh, could have been a, a hard U or could have been a soft U, I was reading today. Surrounded by not chairs, but mats and cushions. With men leaning on their left elbows, because the assumption was everybody's right-handed, because left-handed people are 
cursed by God in some way. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really, anyway, I don't know how they did the left-handed stuff. But so you're, so the picture, once you, well, let me read it. I'll do better if I just read it. Eating, not with a knife, fork, and spoon, but I feel certain with their fingers, which is what you go to Africa, you go to India. You, uh, your fingers, your hands better be washed. Um, this meant, oh, excuse me, in biblical times, one reclined at table. And that's exactly what John 13 says. It says, as Jesus reclined, he didn't sit at table. He's on his left elbow, which means your feet are where? This is very important. This is very important. This means your feet, now hopefully they're tucked a little behind you, but they're quite close to your neighbor's face and the food he's eating and the nose that he can catch the aromas that come from feet. I'll just give you one of the lessons. Low tables uh, and unwashed feet are a bad combination. <laughs> this meant that feet were often near the food and in proximity to their neighbor's nose. Okay. Traditionally, traditionally called the upper room discourse, these five chapters contain the last words of Jesus. As he faces the cross, Jesus emphasizes to his followers the things he most wants them to understand. It's really hard to, to make a chart or an outline of these five chapters. I've tried, and it's, it, it doesn't work well for me. It's like, because he weaves themes around. But these are the themes that, and, and that we'll be talking about. Love. This is where he gives the last, the, or the great commandment. Love one another. The, a new commandment, excuse me, I give to you. Betrayal. There's a Judas among us. One of you, one of you will betray me. It's like, that's just, that's hard. Um, the Holy Spirit, who Jesus calls the comforter or the counselor, uh, the paraclete, the, the term abiding, abide in me. I abide in you, you abide in me, uh, is a big one. Heaven, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again. Persecution, if the world hated me, the world's going to hate you. You're going to leave this meal tonight, and there's going to be people look at you with disdain. They hate you, and they hate the name you bear. Don't be surprised. Really? <laughs> yep. They're about to beat me to a pulp and kill me, Jesus said. And that's what they're going to do to anyone who follows me. Let's talk about that. He talks about shalom, my peace I give to you in this world that hates you. 9-11 kind of world. I give you my shalom and bearing fruit, etc. So there's some great themes going on. The shadow of the cross is there. Jesus is saying goodbye. We've just had a good meal, and we're trying to make sense of it. And it's not that easy. A D, he begins this final conversation by emphasizing the fundamental importance of servanthood. So this is item one in Jesus' curriculum for the upper room is let's talk about servanthood. But he doesn't really talk about it. Now, Jesus is the Word, and a lot of his sermons were verbal. But this is a sermon that really doesn't need words. He just gets up and preached one of the greatest sermons he ever preached, really without opening his mouth. That's it's so good. It's just so good. Um, his words are few as he drives home his message with an acted parable. So tonight, the point is not to remember so much what he said, it's to remember what he did and just the visual of the one who is the king of Israel, the word made flesh, the son of God, the Messiah, on his knees, washing the feet of 
Judas, for example. Pretty dramatic. In washing the disciples' feet, he preaches one of his greatest sermons. In fact, the action should probably be regarded as one of the signs, I just mentioned that, that Jesus did to enable people to see his glory and believe on him. A sign, there's some of them, turning water to wine, feeding 5,000, healing the blind, raising Lazarus, points beyond itself. Don't confuse the sign with the reality to which it points. In other words, don't just get so focused on washing feet that that's all you see. Don't look at the sign, look through it. Jesus, what am I supposed to see in this sign? What's it pointing to? And Jesus will just smile and say, I'm so glad you asked. That's the right question. Because it may not be obvious. It certainly wasn't for Peter. You'll never wash my feet. And even when G Peter agreed to let his feet be washed, he still didn't understand. He said, well, just wash all of me. And Jesus said, no, no, you don't get it. You don't get just your feet, Pete. You know, and Pete just says, I don't, what, what, do you, what is this about? I love Peter. Okay, let's read, let's read our text. You got your Bibles? Uh, incidentally, I try to end about 10 after. I go a little, usually after the hour, uh, but I am conscious of the time. So if um, we got new people, it's always, I want you to feel secure here. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I don't care what translation you bring. You bring any one you want. I think the different translations make it rich. We're going to go 17 verses. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his, what? Hour. Very important word in John. Up until the end of chapter 12, at the end of last spring, Jesus kept saying over and over, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Timing is very important in the kingdom of God. Not just what you do, but when you do it. And even washing feet, it may be the right thing to do, but if you do it at the wrong time, it, it may do more harm than good. But he knows now, his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them, what does your Bible say? The to the end, what else did I hear? The full to the full extent, he showed them the full extent of his love. It's the Greek word T-E-L-O-S, telos, that will mean something to some of you here. It's an important word. It means the end, the goal. It's a word that's often translated perfect. He loved them perfectly. He loved them fully. He loved them with, with his whole being, the full extent. He loved them utterly. Verse 2, during supper... I'm just I'm, I'm making comments as I read. When are feet, incidentally, supposed to be washed when you come to someone's house? I, I think it's pretty clear in other places in Scripture. When you're welcomed at the door, and in most cultures you take your shoes off, I'm assuming we're going to talk more about what's on your feet when you wear sandals and no socks and you walk on dirt roads where camels and dogs and goats, not to mention raw sewage and mud are, you come in the door, you take off your shoes, your feet are what they are. If they're sweaty, everything's sticking. Now if you go right to the table and your feet are six inches from your neighbor's, neighbor's lamb chops, <laughs> It's like this is so during the supper is when Jesus silently gets up to wash feet. In other words, as I pick and I would it would be such fun to be a movie producer to try to get this right. 
They've been eating this. I like to think it maybe was between the entree and the dessert. You know, they've been living with this reality of dirty feet and low tables the whole meal. And nobody had taken care of it. Thirteen grown men. During supper, and notice how Judas plays in the story. When the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing three things. The Father has given him all things. He had come from God. He was going back to God. That is a pregnant verse. I'm going to come back to it. Verse 4, rose from supper. I think if I was a movie producer, the room would just be buzzing with conversation. You know, and Jesus just silently, and if you see him go out of the corner of your yath, maybe he's had to go to the bathroom. Maybe, what's he doing? He, he doesn't say anything. And then he comes back and just silently, and then the, the noise level in the room just goes down a notch, a notch. And then there's just this awkward as they realize what the Messiah, the second person of the Trinity, they know who he is, the King of Israel, what he's doing. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, Lord, <laughs> he, Peter knows who he is, Lord, do you do feet? <laughs> Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you'll understand. Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. I'm going to come back to that. Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you, the word you there is plural, you all are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. I just marvel how often Judas surfaces in this text. John, who's writing it, who was at the table, says, we didn't quite understand it at the time, but we, Judas was there with us. That's part of what we need to grasp. Okay, verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said, Do you understand what I've done to you? I love that question. Because nobody did. <laughs> Not a soul did. But it's a really good question. And it's really the question I want us all to go home with tonight. Do you understand what he's doing? What this sign is pointing to? It's not just that he's washing our feet. He's wanting us to see where this sign points. And he's about to tell us one place. You call me teacher and Lord. And the word teacher probably alludes to the idea of rabbi. And Lord has deity connotations to it. So you know who I am. I'm your rabbi, I'm your Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. 
Okay. We're at Roman numeral two. There are two things going on, at least as I see it, in this passage. I always try to start with the big 36,000 view. Two things are going on. One, Jesus, who John's gospel has already told us is the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel, etc., the bread of life, the light of the world, all these titles we've been seeing of who he is. Jesus is taking the role of a servant. I mean, this is a clash of images. Uh, I, I was, you know, picture Donald Trump changing a diaper of a baby. I, I, don't, know of, I don't know of a good analogy. Uh, it's just, this is, this, is, this is hard. He is performing a disgusting task reserved for slaves. Let me just read my footnote. Remember in the first century, people wore sandals and no socks. Streets were unpaved and frequented not only by people, but also camels, sheep, goats, etc. Beyond the dust and dirt that would stick to sweaty skin. I mean, just remember summer days, especially when you were a kid, how, how dirty your feet could get. I mean, I, I went barefooted all the time when I was growing up. Oh my goodness. Feet would also be dirtied by mud, garbage, sewage, excrement, you know, the cow patties that are in the street. I mean, it's on your feet. Arriving in a home, feet would be caked with mud, grime, so some of it had dried. I mean, this is what feet are, this, it's not like if you've ever been in a foot washing service where everybody's got, takes their socks off and their feet were probably washed in a shower that very morning. It wasn't like that. Um, and I just wrote, when mother told little Levi, go wash your feet before dinner. <laughs> you know, she was not only thinking of proper social etiquette, but of biological hygiene. Low tables and unwashed feet make a toxic situation. So, um, Jesus is doing what only a servant or slave would do. It was both I'm back in the paragraph. It was both shocking and impossible for the disciples to understand that their teacher and Lord would do this. Messiahs don't do feet. This explains why Peter said, No, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. I've got to read my footnote. I am. The statement, no Lord, is an oxymoron. You know what an oxymoron is? It's when you put two words together that are mutually contradictory. For example, jumbo shrimp. I'm giving you some. Or if you say someone is pretty ugly. Have I done this with you? Anyway, I, I've, uh, I did it at some of the camp meetings this summer. Postal service or United Methodists. There you go. Those are some good examples of... I got some laughs on that. Uh, so when Peter says, no, Lord, for one thing he's saying, Lord, which means you're in charge of my life, but if I'm the apostle of the foot-shaped mouth, <laughs> Peter, you know, it's, it's not hard for me to say, no, Lord. I've tried that stunt a few times myself. I don't recommend it. Um, if you want a good four-point uh, sermon series study the four times Peter said no Lord you want me to give you the I've got, you got the references one was when Jesus said I must go to Jerusalem I must be rejected I must be crucified and Pete in Matthew's gospel says no Lord Messiahs don't do crosses Messiahs do thrones when the Messiah comes he's not going to be rejected and killed he's going to Sit on the throne. Uh, the other one, Mark, Mark 14, is when Jesus says, one of you will betray me. No, Lord, <laughs> not me. I'm the rock. Remember, you named me rock. Matthew might desert you. He works for the IRS. Always been a little questionable. Tom's a skeptic. Uh, but you can count on the rock. I will never deny you. 
<laughs> Third time is this example when he's washing feet. No, Lord. <laughs> My favorite is Acts chapter 10 is when, uh, this is after Pentecost, no less. Peter's in Joppa up on the roof at noon taking a nap and he's hungry and a sheet is let down from heaven and you can't make this story up, it's so funny. And in the sheet are ham sandwiches, bacon, barbecue, and pork rinds. <laughs> you know, it's like, and a voice from heaven says, arise, Peter, and eat. And you'll never guess what Pete says. <laughs> he says, no, Lord, I'm, I'm kosher. I'm Jewish, remember? I don't do pork. And Matt, Acts says, it happened three times. Arise, Peter. Have a barbecue sandwich. No, Lord. Arise, Peter. Have eggs and bacon. No, Lord. And that was the moment there was a knock on the door downstairs. And some men from Cornelius' house, an unclean Gentile, said to the owner of the house, our master Cornelius had a dream and he dreamed about God and said that if we'd come to this house, there was somebody here who could tell him the way to heaven. <laughs> it's like Peter said, that would be me. <laughs> if that had happened 30 minutes earlier, I would have said, no, Lord, I don't do Gentiles. And we would have never heard the gospel. I mean, that's how important this story is. But that's a sidebar. The no, I, I love Peter. Because I, I, I am Peter. I mean, I've, I've pulled this shenanigans. Okay, so two things are going on in the passage. One is, Jesus is washing feet. The second thing going on, Jesus is calling his disciples to imitate his example. And if the first thing is hard to accept, the second is even harder. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. It was not just difficult for the disciples to envision their teacher and Lord washing feet. They found it impossible to see themselves washing feet. I think... Uh, well, let me just jump to the application. Talk to me on this. Think of some roles today that some of us might be tempted to say, I would never... That's beneath my dignity. What are some roles? Let's just try to help me. What are you thinking, Paula? You, oh, I thought you had a. No, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I've scared you because I'm. Somebody's going to feel unspiritual. What are what are some jobs jobs in life that you just say? I'd never work at McDonald's. I would be so humiliated at, at age 65 to work at McDonald's. I don't know. Or to collect trash. I don't. Cleaning septic tanks. A what? Cleaning out septic tanks. Cleaning out septic tanks? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But th that's, that's the category of washing feet. And again, think of the feet I described with dried, caked, mud, of everything from the street, and, um, and usually the lowest of the slaves. Cleaning out spit tanks. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I'm not even. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> That's. Some traditions. Um, believe that Jesus was giving a command to be taken literally. I'd love to hear some of your responses to this if we had time. These churches practice foot washing as a third sacrament, along with baptism and Holy Communion. Interestingly, I'm sharing my own bias, there's no evidence in the New Testament that churches practiced such a rite Though there's plenty of evidence they practiced baptism and Holy Communion. But we don't hear of any stories in the book of Acts or while they were washing each other's feet kind of stories. Most traditions 
have seen Jesus' command as a spiritual command to humbly serve one another. That it's not a literal command. There are traditions, and I don't, it's possible there's some among us who grew up in traditions, and maybe you think that when he said, I've given you an example, you're supposed to do it. That, and this is why I say, don't get caught up on the sign. Look through the sign to what it, what it points to. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep going. If I open it up there, we'll never get back. B, normally when guests arrive for dinner, I think I've said all this, a servant would wash their feet before the evening meal. However, on this occasion, no one had anticipated how this would be handled. The text indicates it was during supper that Jesus quietly got up and began to wash their feet. Perhaps it was between the entree and the dessert. I just If I was a movie producer, you know, when did this happen? But this is, this is when I know I would make it happen if I was producing it. More poignantly, perhaps it was during that point in the conversation when, quote, according to Luke, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Did you know that verse was in there? Yeah. Luke says specifically, during the Last Supper, an argument started out. And they were playing spiritual one-upmanship. Man. And I think that's when Jesus just pushed back, never said a thing, just went and found a towel. And then the quiet in the room, I think, was so thick you could have cut it with a knife. As they were just exposed for the egotistical, arrogant, it wasn't just their feet that were dirty. It was their hearts. Uh, see, Judas plays an important role in the narrative. Jesus' humble act was his final appeal for Judas not to do what he was about to do. How would you portray that if you were producing the scene? Jesus washing Judas' feet. It almost appears that having his feet washed was the final straw for Judas and was the very thing that pushed him over the edge. True service to others brings out the best and also the worst. I, uh, I'm not enough of a psychologist to try to analyze what would go on in Judas's heart, you know, as he's watching. But I think that was, he said, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to do it. I've been thinking about it for weeks. I'm going to do it tonight. What, what pushed him over the edge? Okay. This is the application part. Prerequisites for effective ministry. The model. Do you understand what I've done to you? This is a good question. In this nonverbal act of service, Jesus is giving a graphic picture of what true ministry looks like. And by the word ministry, you can use the word service because ministry and service are the same word. To minister is to serve. We sort of separate them in English. Because he himself highlights the importance of following his example, we can be sure that he intends for us to use this model as the plumb line or the standard to measure all Christian service. So anytime you're serving in the name of Christ, this is the model. Obedience should not be measured by observing a literal right, but rather by incarnating in our own lives the humility and love that enables us to connect meaningfully with others by serving them at their point of need. It's not me telling you where I think I want to serve you because it makes me feel good when I do certain things for wretched people like you. <laughs> no, it's discovering where there's a real need. Your feet are a mess. <laughs> and I want to meet you. Um, just as Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, 
So he expects us to live our lives with the same attitude or the same mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Philippians 2. Okay. This is harder than you think. Serving others as Jesus did is not easy. Some will be too arrogant to even try. But I sort of doubt that's true for many people in a room like this. I think most of us know we're supposed to serve and we're supposed to not be arrogant. But when we try to serve, we don't quite get it right. Most who do try will soon discover that their service to others is tainted with a mixture of carnal self-interest and or unholy feelings of self-abasement. And what I mean by that is self-interest. Okay, why am I serving you people tonight by teaching you the Bible? Is it because I'm so concerned for you and I love you so much? And I, or is it because I just love to hear myself talk and to think that 30 people would come out and take notes? Do you hear the ego in that? There's a lot of ego in ministry. I've got pastors over here that are saying, yeah, oh, it's, it's, uh, and you can't always tell just by watching. Um, or somebody, say, who serves in the nursery, the self-abasement part at church, says, well, you know, I'm not good enough to sit on a board or a committee, and I'm just, I'm just nobody, so I just want to, well, that's, that's almost as bad as the ego. It's like, you're, you are somebody. You're important. You've got gifts. And it's, it's, I don't know if you're hearing me, but there, this, this cuts two ways. So how can I serve like Jesus? I am so glad you asked. Uh, so I got, this is my three-point sermon, and it's really a, good. We got ten minutes to do it. The motive is love. The text begins by underscoring the fact that Jesus loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. The Greek form term telos indicates that his love had reached its fullest completion. He showed them the full extent of his love. He now showed how perfect his love was. His ministry was not motivated by self-interest of any kind, only love. Why would Jesus wash their feet? Was he trying to score points? Was he trying to manipulate them? Was he using his gift? <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's a very good question. Why would he do it? He said, I want you to see how much I love you. It's like, that is so convicting. Think of possible ministry options, help in the nursery, at church, cut a neighbor's grass, prepare a meal, make a donation, preach a sermon, go on a missions trip, and then share with us some possible motives. Give me some possible motives for why people do those things. Other than love. Other than love. What are some motives? Let's get in touch with, why do we go to church every Sunday? Why do we go on a missions trip? Why do we tithe? Why do we come here on Tuesday nights? Are our motives... Yes, Bonnie. <laughs> that is beautiful <laughs> and we're laughing because we can totally identify with that see no it's but we would all come out and say oh June you guys are so wonderful you cut your neighbor's grass and you would just smile and say, yeah. I don't know. We're, what else? What are, yeah. Sometimes the hound of heaven will not let you go until you do volunteer to work with 700 middle school kids. <laughs> so guilt? No. No. Correction. Conviction. 
Conviction, okay. I learned as a pastor that guilt is a really good way to motivate people. <laughs> like, for, like for nursery helpers. Oh my goodness, you can put a guilt trip on a congregation and get 12 new names on a, if you, but that's not love. That's, you're appealing. What else? Somebody else had a, what were you, yes, Gary. Uh, like on a mission trip. Uh, our, our church had a special mission occasionally in Austria. And I would just love to go back to Austria. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so there was a time off when I wasn't serving in the, the mission itself. You're talking to somebody who served in Paris, France for 10 years. And Katie and I got this all the You're going to where on the mission field? Papua New Guinea? No, we feel called to Paris. You, people would roll their eyes and say, I'll bet you do. <laughs> you know. Anyway. I wouldn't want to go back to Guatemala. Okay. Well, you get the point. And Jesus is getting us in touch with our motives. And he wants us to know there's only one reason. I'm washing feet. It's because I love the people I serve. And it's why I started out with talking about mothers. Because why do mothers go to the grocery store until they're, they could drive there in the dark? I mean, with their eyes closed and they're, because they love their kids. They'd die for their kids. And when those receiving ministry, maybe this is more important, detect that the motive for service is something other than love, how do they feel? How did the people in Papua New Guinea, <laughs> those, those wretched heathen natives feel when they realize you really came here to be with your grandkids, not with us? I'm kidding. Actually, they thought it was pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> they loved the fact that we were there and were very, very no. Wow. Yeah. Part of their community But the point being, people can de detect our motives. They know why we are cutting their grass. They know why we brought the meal over. They can detect it if there's ego in preaching. Oh my goodness. You can smell it. You can smell it when Yes? Well, if you can detect what, what the motive is, then that gives you an underlying understanding of how to manipulate them. <laughs> no, it's, no, and manipulate is a good word. Service, how many of us give money in an effort to manipulate something? Have we really given it to God, or is this our way of controlling the outcome? It's, it's, Okay, point made. Number two, timing is divinely orchestrated. Jesus washed feet only when he knew that his hour had come. I mentioned those things. Look at the comment I made. Can you name a ministry experience in your life when the action was right, but the timing was wrong? I have, uh, I'm going to get to the last point, but I, Jesus in John's gospel is very conscious of the clock. And by the clock, I just mean, is it the time? And this was time to wash feet. And it had its maximum impact. I, I don't know what to do with that, except I know in ministry, timing is big. But the main point, and I'm sending you home with this. Number three, the servant is secure in his own or her own self-identity. This really works on me. To be an effective servant takes more than love and a divine sense of timing. The servant must know how to answer the question, who am I? To take the role of a servant and to perform menial tasks is more challenging than it first appears. 
when the servant does not have proper self-awareness and a clear understanding of his identity in Christ, he may do more harm than good. Has anybody read that book I've mentioned in the footnote, When Helping Hurts? This is one of those books that is like, that's a great title for a book. That's a great title. Uh, the subtitle is when, uh, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor. This is Moody Press. I mean, this is a good book on social involvement, but with an evangelical understanding. But it's a recognition that sometimes in trying to help, and this is exhibit A, exhibit a for these folks is like Africa trying to bring economic help. Sometimes we actually do more harm than good. From so self-awareness is what speaks to that. Perhaps the most important verse in our scripture is one that is typically overlooked. I emphasized it as I was reading. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, knowing that he had come from God, and knowing that he was going back to God, took a towel and washed feet. That's a marvelous statement. The scripture emphasizes that Jesus was self-aware. He knew who he was. Specifically, he knew three things. He knew his resources. The Father's given all things into my hands. I'm not doing this because I want an offering to be taken after it's over. I'm not doing this because I don't know what else to do. I'm not doing this because I don't have a team of people behind me to help. No. Uh, I, th this, this summer I visited the grave of Francis Asbury and discovered when I got there in Baltimore, 20 feet from Francis Asbury is the grave of E. Stanley Jones. And the verse on E. Stanley Jones's tombstone is 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 21, all things are yours. The verse I just quoted. I mean, it's, it's the Paul's quoting of Jesus. All things are yours. And that was sort of Stanley Jones's life verse. All things are yours. You're not poor. You own the kingdom. Live like it. Well, my bank account is pretty bad shape. It's like, no, that, that doesn't change the truth. All things are yours. Because you can't serve if you don't have that, serve like Jesus, unless you have that awareness. I'm not serving. I'm, all things are ours. I, okay. He knew his resources. Number second bullet, he knew his origin. He knew he had come from God. And third bullet, he knew his destiny. That's why he could serve. He knew his resources. He knew where he'd come from. He knew where he was going. And if you're going to serve effectively, if I'm going to serve effectively, that's what we need to know. All things are yours. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. I, I, I want to develop this, and I haven't yet. The only way to ensure that servanthood never becomes demeaning, debasing, and undignified, and the only protection against hurting others in our attempts to help them, and the only safeguard that serving others will be valued as a character trait one aspires to have. In other words, I want to grow up to be a servant like Jesus. And by the way, why do we call it the prime minister? You ever thought of that? It means the first servant. Is how, at least in England, they, and it's like you aspire to be great in the kingdom, and even in our vocabulary, well, that means to be a great servant. Because serving is a value. I don't know if that's true in Eastern religions. I don't know that, I don't know that that's true. I don't, I, that, I, we ought to study that. Jesus made serving and things like washing feet something to aspire. I want to serve. I want to serve. 
So the only way to preserve that is A, if we know our resources, B, if we know our origin, and C, if we know our destiny. I'll just close with two examples and give a prayer. But Mother Teresa, listen, and I, I did get to Calcutta once. Tim Philpot got to meet Mother Teresa. She had died when I was there, but I, wow, name dropper. <laughs> he said twice. He's met her twice. That's beautiful, Tim. Uh, but the House of the Dead, I mean, it's where she, people came to die, and she would just love them. Mother, but listen to what she said. The point in life is not to do great things, but to do little things in a great way. That's a game changer. That's, and that's how she took care of lepers. She wasn't trying to be a saint. She wasn't trying to have, be the woman of the year in Time Magazine or whatever. I think that was the furthest thing from her mind. She was trying to love a leper in a great way. It's like. And Brother Lawrence, uh, in the book, The Practice of the Presence, uh, these are just, if you've never read Practice of the Presence, it, do it before you die. Just promise me you'll do it before you die. It's just a great classic of the spiritual life. He was a, a cook in a 17th century monastery. So he's among all these holy monks, and his job is in the kitchen. But he's the one we talk about. Listen, quote, I possess God as peacefully in the bustle of my kitchen, where sometimes several people are asking me for different things at the same time, <laughs> as I do upon my knees before the blessed sacrament. In other words, when I'm in church and worship, I'm just as much in the presence of God when I'm at my sink. And I love this. I turn my little omelet in the pan for the love of God. That's just... I mean, they get it. They get it. Jesus set the example. As I've done to you, so you do. Okay. We'll pick it up there next week. It's the story of Judas. Judas is about to leave. And it simply says, and it was night. And we're going to talk about Judas next week. And um, let me pray. Lord, uh, do we understand what you've done for us? I pray that tonight, even as we sleep, we would just allow your spirit to help us understand and to realize that there's no way we can serve others in the spirit of Christ unless Christ has served us. That's just sort of how it works. And unless we know that all things are ours and what our origin is and what our destiny is, we're secure in our identity. That enables us to realize that nothing is beneath our dignity. And we're able to serve like Christ served. Release us. And even before bedtime tonight, enable us to serve someone in that spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.